All right, so we can start now. We have a good audience, about 60, and uh, I'm sure it will probably go on. So uh, let's uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's really my pleasure to uh, welcome you to this, uh, uh, I think, 46th uh, seminar of WPS. Uh, so, first of all, good morning to the colleagues in Europe, good afternoon to the colleagues and friends in India or the Asian region. Uh, it's really my pleasure today to welcome you uh, to this uh, 46th uh, seminar of the webinar series on Spintronics. I'm uh, really happy today that we have uh, Professor Pito Gamadela today uh, giving his lecture. Uh, I think uh, he does not need any real formal introduction because everybody knows instinct and strongly about him. But nevertheless, uh, as a matter of formality or for new students, for their benefit, I give a very, very brief introduction about uh, Vitro. So, uh, Vitro graduated uh, Juma Cum Laude, that's the highest uh, academic uh, grade in physics uh, from the University of Genova and obtained his PhD degree from the Ecole Polytechnic Federal Lausanne EPL, EPFL, with a thesis on growth and electronic and magnetic properties of metallic nanowires. He was a postdoctoral fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Solid State Physics in Stuttgart in Germany, and a research assistant at EPFL until 2005. In 2006, he was appointed the ICREA Research Professor at the Catalan Institute of Nanotechnology in Barcelona in Spain. And since 2013, he is uh, working at the Department of Materials at ETH Zurich as a full professor. His uh, research interests are in the areas of spintronic and interface physics. Uh, I request others to mute. Okay. Uh, so uh, he has been honored with many awards and recognitions. I just read a few. Uh, in uh, 2003, he got the Swiss Physical Society Award at General Physics, ABB Prize. In uh, 2003, also, he got the Prix Laxis University International Laxis Foundation. In 2007, he got the Young Scientist Award by the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility in Grenoble in France. And 2007, he got the Starting Grant Award from the European Research Council. And in 2018, he has got the Golden Owl Award for excellence in teaching by ETH Judy. So with this uh, brief introduction, I again welcome you all and uh, Petro you on behalf of my team, uh, Braj and Puspendra, and we are very much looking forward to your talk. So there may be some new participants. I just mentioned that during the lecture, we don't take questions unless it's a really urgent one. Otherwise you can write your questions in the chat box and after the lecture, we will take one. So with all this, I'm very happy to welcome you, Peter, again, and please, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Marker. Thank you for the nice introduction, and most of all, for the invitation to uh, talk today and present our work. So let me share the, the screen. I think you should be able to see it, right? Is that OK? Yeah, I see. Okay, so uh, I would also like to thank uh, the um, colleagues that have contributed to this work, who have performed the measurements, in particular Viola Krizakova, Eva Grimaldi, Giacomo Sala, who have uh, worked on the time resolved uh, measurements that I will present uh, together with Kevin Garello and the IMEC group in, in Leuven in Belgium. And also the group of Laura Heiderman at PSI, in particular at Saucho, Lugo, and Alice Rabek, who have performed measurements on uh, the main wall uh, manipulation. So, um, as you see, the topic of, of the talk is charge spin conversion, and uh, in particular, how to exploit this phenomena in order to control the magnetization of uh, devices, as well as to manipulate the main wall in uh, uh, racetrack type of structures. So uh, this is a, a spintronic seminar, so I guess I need to tell you uh, very little about uh, 
potential applications of this, we know that uh, you know, first generation of spintronic devices has found uh, many useful applications in sensors, magnetic sensors for uh, reading out information from hard drives, but also uh, in all kinds of uh, positioning sensors based on, on magnetic field detection, uh, as well as in uh, magnetic uh, random access memories. And, and here you see a, a cartoon of such a memory based on, on magnetic tunnel junctions. Uh, but there are many new directions that have been enabled by, by recent research in, in charge spin conversion. And these have to do with memory and logic applications as well as uh, probabilistic computing, uh, neuromorphic computing. Then if we go into magnonics, we can also think of wave computing, for example. Now, uh, all this is made possible by the fact that uh, we can couple different degrees of freedom uh, by taking advantage of uh, a particular spinorbic coupling, uh, whereby we can um, you know, establish a link between the orbital and spin momentum in the material. And the orbital momentum is also related to the uh, momentum of uh, electrons and therefore to, to current. Okay. And of course, all these uh, effects and, and, and quantities depend um, on other parameters as well, like temperature. They can also be uh, manipulated by light absorption or electric polarization. And so all these interconversions can then be used to sense the magnetization, to switch it, or even to couple it. So uh, now in the first part of the talk, we are concerned with, with effects that uh, allow to convert the charge current into a, a spin current or a spin accumulation. And this, as, as you probably all know, are, are divided into two broad categories. Uh, one is uh, uh, spin-dependent scattering that separates electrons according to their uh, spin momentum. And this includes the, uh, the spin hole effect that leads to a, a accumulation at the boundary of a sample of uh, uh, non-equilibrium uh, spin population. And uh, the other class of phenomena is, is um, let's say, exemplified by the Rush by Edelstein effect, uh, where the uh, electrons that travel in a, in a conductor, for example, in a two-dimensional conductor with uh, structure inversion symmetry, uh, asymmetry then um, are subject to a, a, an effective magnetic field that polarizes their spin along a transverse direction. And this leads to a homogeneous interfacial spin polarization. Now, these effects can be detected uh, even without uh, making use of uh, magnetic materials. So in general, one detects a spin accumulation by its influence on the magnetization of a nearby magnet but they can also be detected uh, by themselves using, for example, uh, magneto-optic curve effect as uh, schematized in this, in this cartoon. And this is uh, an experiment similar to what has been performed in the early 2000s to detect the spin hole effect in gallium arsenide by, by the Ashalon group. Uh, these experiments can also be performed on metals, but they're a bit more uh, difficult in terms of, of uh, signal to detect because the, the spin accumulation that can be detected is the in-plane spin accumulation that requires a longitudinal Mach geometry, which is less sensitive than a polar geometry. Uh, nonetheless, if one performs a, an experiment where uh, we have just a, a platinum hole bar, where we send an AC current and we look at the Mach signal across the, this, this whole bar, and, and here you see the optical profile of the bar, we can detect a, a curve rotation in correspondence of uh, platinum in this, the amplitude of this rotation scales proportionally to the current. And so this is a signature, is a magnetic signature in a non-magnetic material, if you want, which is induced by, by the current. And in fact, we can repeat the same experiment of tungsten, observe the opposite K rotation, which is also related to the opposite sign of the spin hole effect in this material. Now, these are very tiny signals that also correspond to a very tiny 
non-equilibrium magnetization induced by the current. But this non-equilibrium magnetization is continuously supplied by, by the current to the interface of uh, these materials. And uh, therefore, if you now have a bilayer system where a, a magnet is deposited on top of such a conductor, in this case, a heavy metal, then this uh, spin accumulation is, um, is transferred uh, or diffuses into the magnet, creating a, a spin current. And, and the absorption of this current creates uh, spin torques. Right? And, and the spin torques are created irrespective of the mechanism that uh, generates the, the spin accumulation. So um, we expect that for a spin hole effect, but also for Rushbar Edelstein effect or uh, other types of uh, non equilibrium effect that induce a, a, a spin accumulation at the interface between a, a non magnetic material and a magnet. Okay. And generally, just by symmetry arguments, the, the spin torques that are uh, generated by this uh, non equilibrium spin accumulation are of uh, two types. One is the uh, damping like torque, and the other one is the so called field like torque. Uh, these are uh, similar to what is sort of observed in spin transfer torque um, measurements. And often we detect these torques by the corresponding uh, magnetic field that we associate to the torques, so the, the field like uh, effective field, which has a fixed direction, and the damping like effective field, which uh, rotates with the magnetization. And uh, this is the important field for for most switching experiments. We can see how uh, the switching works. Uh, if we consider a simple model system where we have a, a cobalt thin layer, this is a ferromagnet with perpendicular magnetization deposited on a platinum uh, hole cross here, and uh, which is capped then by aluminum oxide, which also promotes perpendicular magnetic anisotropy. In what we observed about 10 years ago, um, these were experiments performed by Mikhail Miron and collaboration with the SpinTech in Grenoble, is that um, sending current pulses through this uh, platinum current line induces switching of the magnetization in a, in a controlled way. So positive current pulse, negative current pulse result in opposite switching direction, uh, provided that uh, we apply an in-plane magnetic field that determines the polarity of the switching. Now, this is a very, of course, very interesting effect because we can switch single layer ferromagnets, it also works with ferromagnets, and uh, in some cases also for antiferromagnets, uh, as well as for insulating materials. So it's really a, an interesting phenomenon. Now, to see why the uh, damping like torque in combination with an external in plane field induces a switching, we can use either a simple macro spin model where uh, here we see the damping like torque due to the absorption of the spin current with the same spin polarization as the torque. Now, this corresponds to this uh, rotating damping like field that uh, promotes the, the reversal of the magnetization, right? Uh, however, you need to break the symmetry of this torque in order to uh, determine which configuration is stable and which one is unstable. And that is what is done by applying an in-plane external field that, um, for example, favors switching in this situation and uh, stabilizes the magnetization in this other situation. Now, this is a, a you know, microspin picture, which is rarely the case in the structures that we study because uh, in, in uh, you know, magnetic dots that are more than a few nanometers uh, in, in size, uh, the magnetic reversal is not coherent. So we need to consider the reversal by the main wall uh, propagation. In this, in this type of systems is, is also peculiar because first of all, the domain walls are in many cases of nail type, as you see uh, sketched here. This is an effect also of spin orbit coupling induced by uh, that induces the, an interfacial jadlicinski mori interaction, promoting such nail domain walls. And then the effect of the damping-like uh, field on these nail walls is, is extremely strong because it 
the stamping like field at the domain wall position acts as an easy access field and therefore promotes the expansion of a, uh, the domain wall that is aligned with the damping like field. In this case, the, the blue domain here will tend to move to the, to the right. Okay. Now, opposite domains move together. And so, again, here you need to apply an in plane field to favor the expansion of one domain with respect to the other. So it's again a symmetry breaking mechanism, but a bit different from, from the macro spin case. So now this effect can be uh, used in, in devices, in particular magnetic tunnel junctions, which form the core of a, of a magnetic random access memory. And it works in all kinds of configurations. So we have, uh, for example, three layers with perpendicular magnetization, three layer with in-plane magnetization oriented uh, perpendicular to the current flow, as well as uh, three layers with magnetization oriented parallel to the current flow. Okay. And in all these cases, one observes uh, switching and therefore you can fabricate this type of three terminal devices where switching is performed by uh, an in-plane current, so by spinomic torques, and reading is performed by a tunneling into resistance measure. Now, what is also interesting in this type of three terminal devices is that uh, there are actually different effects that uh, can promote switching. And so it's interesting to look at the interplay of these effects. Uh, so I, I mentioned spin orbit torques, but of course one can also use uh, spin transfer torque. Okay, by sending a, a, a current pulse that, uh, that generates a spin polarized current traveling through the reference layer and then acting on the free layer. Now, uh, spin transfer torque in the situation depicted here uh, generally results in, in quite a long delay times. That's because the uh, magnetization of the reference and free layers are aligned at rest. And so one needs to. Uh, have some thermal fluctuations that induces a means alignment in order for the torque to be active. However, spin orbit torques by um, yeah, construction, they are orthogonal, in particular the damping like spin orbit torque is orthogonal to the magnetization at rest. And so it is immediately active as a torque. And so this uh, is expected to, to induce a faster switching relative to ST. And there is a, a third effect that is also very interesting that comes together with an STT. And that is the fact that whenever you apply a voltage to the top electrode of the junction, you're also gating the free layer. And this gating induces changes of the magnetic anisotropy, of the crystalline magnetic anisotropy. Essentially, this is by, by modifying the occupation of the uh, magnetic orbitals at the interface between the free layer and the tunnel barrier. And that results in changes of the anisotropy, which is, have also been used to promote switching and in some cases even to induce switching. So uh, to uh, present some, some actual measurements here, these are uh, magnetic tunnel junctions with perpendicular magnetization uh, fabricated at IMEC by uh, Kevin Garrell and the workers. Uh, where we have cobalt iron boron free layer on top of a tungsten, beta tungsten current line. This junction has PMA. Uh, and this is the, the tunneling magnetic resistance uh, for the parallel and anti parallel state. And uh, in order to measure this uh, device, we use a, a dual pulse scheme where uh, we take a, a fast pulser, we split the pulses in two. Um, Long two paths, and we can control the amplitude of these two pulses separately and send them one to the top electrode that produces STT as well as uh, VCMA, so this voltage control of magnetic anisotropy, and the other one produces this spin orbit torque. Okay. And we call this these pulses VMTJ for the top one and VSOT for the bottom one. So first of all, what we observe, if we perform a time result measurements by looking at the resistance of the junction with a, with a fast oscilloscope here, we see that 
uh, if we send a, an SOT pulse that is about 300 picoseconds in width, we can achieve 100% switching, provided that uh, we have a certain amplitude of the voltage, which is in this case nearly two times the, the minimum, uh, the critical voltage required to achieve 50% uh, uh, switching. Okay. And, and this switching is really fast, so it, it terminates before the end of the current pulse. It's a, okay. So this occurs in what we call the uh, overcritical conditions. But it's also interesting to see what happens uh, when we are close to critical conditions and also to analyze the, what are the effects of different pulses. So for example, an STT only pulse, so we only bias the top electrode uh, by sending current pulses that are 15 nanoseconds long. And these are single shot switching traces that show the reversal of the uh, free layer magnetization. And they also show that, uh, as you see here, the initial time where the reversal starts, what is called an incubation delay or a delay time in STT, uh, is, is stochastically distributed and can be very large. And also that we have fairly long uh, reversal phases, this, this transition times. Okay. So we expect that these times are reduced for SOT, but in fact, when we perform these measurements and we uh, essentially bias the, the bottom electrode with uh, SOT only and with minimal uh, contributions from STT and NCMA, we saw that again we have a large stochasticity in the uh, uh, initial uh, delay times in the in the transition times. That's uh, was surprising, but we also noticed that if we then uh, combine SOT and STT pulses in such a way that uh, the sign of the um, bias on the top electrodes uh, promotes uh, a reduction of the magnetic anisotropy. At the same time as we send the current pulse on, along the SOT line, then we achieve a uh, in a much shorter uh, delay times and also much shorter transition times. And this can become extreme if we increase the in-plane field that I mentioned before that we need to apply to, to determine the polarity of switching. This really becomes uh, almost deterministic with uh, delay times below a nanosecond. And uh, we can show the statistics of this T0 and delta T times here. Uh, you have the T0 okay, for STT only and for SOT, we see that it's quite broad, but as soon as we apply a, an assisting bias uh, on top of the MTJ, which is much smaller than, still much smaller than the critical STT switching bias, uh, we get a, a shorter times. And um, the reversal time, so this phase here is, is quite fast compared to STT. That's typical of, of current induced domain wall motion by SOT. And if we combine this uh, two uh, times, we, we achieve uh, this total switching time distributions that you see here. Now, uh, if we apply large in plane field, as it's shown before, this distribution can be made really narrow. So we have for the total switching time, we have um, uh, you know, width of the switching distribution that is smaller than, than uh, about 0.2 nanoseconds. And that's really typical of SOT. Okay. This is still being close to critical conditions in regard to the bias voltages applied to the junction. But one question is why do we have a delay time at all in SOT? Because I mentioned before that the damping like torque uh, should be immediately active on the magnetization, right? And in fact, even in simulations, so my micromagnetic simulation of SOT switching, we do observe immediate action of the damping like torque on the magnetization, leading to, to immediate switching. Right? Uh, so why do we observe a delay in experiments, in particular close to critical conditions? Well, because uh, when we, uh, the, the SOT bias approaches the critical voltage, right, then 
the SOT is essentially uh, fighting against the magnetic anisotropy energy barrier of the free layer. And these barriers in our system are, are quite high. So there is an effective magnetic anisotropy field of the order of 0.2, 0 0.3 Tesla. And so um, the delay time is actually uh, due to a heating effect of the current, which you can see here. So the current pulse um, uh, effectively heats the, the free layer. This is a simulated temperature profile in the free layer for 15, 10 nanoseconds long current pulse. And this heating uh, has uh, essentially uh, an effect on the magnetization. It reduces the saturation magnetization of the system. But most importantly, it reduces the magnetic anisotropy there. And so once the anisotropy decreases, then the SOT uh, is, uh, you know, has an easier um, task to reverse the magnetization by uh, inducing a, the nucleation of a reverse domain on an edge of the sample and then propagating this domain towards the opposite edge. This is what the simulations tell us, but it's also what we observe by uh, performing um, scanning X-ray transmission measurements of magnetization reversal in cobalt platinum dots. Let's see if I can play a movie here. So uh, these are um, movies taken during a current pulse that is sent through a, a platinum line here. And these measurements are performed on a silicon nitride membrane, which is transparent to X-rays. And if we tune the X-rays to the uh, cobalt absorption edge, uh, using circularly polarized light, we are performing a time resolve with MCD measurements. And so you see that uh, as a current pulse arrives, then we indeed have uh, edge nucleation and then propagation of domain walls, following a, quite a peculiar pattern of nucleations and um, in domain wall propagation directions, which is determined by the damping light torque, but also by the uh, fact that we have a jaluzinski mori interaction that favors edge nucleation, and by the fact that we have a field-like torque in the system. So if you would like to have more details on this, I, I refer you to this uh, publication. OK, uh, I, I mentioned before that we need an in-plane field to determine the polarity of switching. Uh, but this in-plane field can also be embedded in, in a device. There are several strategies to uh, produce an in-plane field, for example, also by exchange bias. Uh, here, uh, the strategy used by Garel and co-workers is to uh, fabricate a hard mask on top of the uh, magnetic tunnel junction that produces a stray field. And this uh, stray field then is what we need to uh, achieve deterministic SOT switching. And so even at zero field, if we increase the voltage bias, we can switch this junction very fast, as you see here. Now, uh, this interplay of effects that we observe in these three terminal devices uh, can be um, understood and modeled. OK, now this is a bit of a long story, so I, I just present some of the uh, final results here of, of a recent study that we made. These are uh, simulated switching curves using um, micromagnetic um, models based on, on the actual magnetic parameters of our junctions. And what we see here is uh, for a given applied V S of T that would induce switching uh, that is thermally activated on this time scale. We see what are the effects of uh, all this separate um, uh, phenomena that can take place in a three-terminal tunnel junction. For example, if we add STT, right, this uh, has a rather minor influence on, on the switching time. Uh, temperature increase has a stronger influence. 
VCMA even stronger influence. So if we reduce the magnetic anisotropy energy barrier during the pulse, we achieve uh, more than 50% reduction of the incubation time with respect to SFT. And if we put all these effects together, uh, then of course uh, the, the final effect is even larger. What is also interesting is that uh, SOT generally requires much larger switching current than STT. So we are to switch at one nanosecond time scales, we're at the order of 10 to the 8 ampere per square centimeters, whereas STT is the order of 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 ampere per square centimeter. Uh, however, SOT can achieve switching faster. So this reduces the overall energy uh, required for switching. As you see here, this is proportional to the duration of the impulses used to switch. Uh, but then uh, if we assist SOT switching by uh, an MTJ bias, so which induces both VCMA and STT in additional heat, uh, we can uh, go below the critical energy required for switching by STT uh, by uh, tuning the interplay of all this STT, SOT, VCMA, etc. And so I think that's very interesting for, for future applications that require speed as well as low energy. Okay, now just to, to uh, uh, change a bit arguments so moving away from the MTJ devices and uh, looking into domain world motion. Uh, and mentioning also that SOT are effective in switching the magnetization, not only of uh, metal systems, but also of magnetic insulators. Okay. Typical systems that have been studied uh, both by our group, but also by the group of Jeff Beach and, and John Afchi in MIT, are uh, platinum garnets, uh, where a garnet has perpendicular anisotropy. And what you see in this uh, movie that is playing now is a, a, a tulium iron garnet layer with perpendicular magnetization that is switching under the action of an out of plane magnetic field. Okay. And we also see that uh, we have a platinum. Uh, whole bar pattern on top of the film, but for the moment we have no current. So we just see that the magnetization switches by field. Okay. Now uh, we remove the field and uh, apply a current through the same system. And what we see, uh, these are mock images, we see that we have the nucleation of a domain and expansion of a domain. Uh, along the platinum hole bar. So wherever the current is on, we have a spin orbit torque that promotes the nucleation of the domain and then the propagation of the domain hole bar. And so we effectively switch only the, uh, the region of the garnet that is underneath platinum where the current passes. And if we reverse the direction of the current pulses, we can uh, switch it back. Okay. So, uh, this shows that SOTs are really very effective, not only in driving the main walls, but also in controlling the magnetization of insulators. So, how does this work? This is uh, essentially the, the same mechanism that I mentioned in the introduction of the talk. Uh, imagine we have a, a racetrack with uh, up and down magnetization, as you see here, separated by a nail domain wall with in-plane magnetization along the current direction. Then the damping-like torque is equivalent to a, an easy axis effective field that uh, promotes the expansion of the uh, domain with magnetization pointing up. And this is what we see also in micromagnetic simulations. Okay. There's also an interesting tilt of the domain wall magnetization, which is due to the interplay of jaluzinski mori interaction and damping light torque. Okay. Now, this has been explained and uh, uh, also exploited in many different uh, systems based on different types of uh, racetrack 
structures. And so uh, it's really a very effective way of moving domain walls. Now let's consider a bit the structure of these domain walls, of these chiral domain walls that are induced by the jalansinski mori interaction. So uh, this is the, the effective Hamiltonian corresponding to the jalansinski mori interaction, which promotes uh, perpendicular orientation of neighboring spins according to a, a well-defined uh, rotational sense, and that's the chirality of the DMI. So this is the situation in typical uh, platinum cobalt uh, structures. And, and these are the, the nail wall with um, left chirality. Now, imagine what happens if we cut the system and realize a, a, a magnetic layer that is half magnetized out of plane and half magnetized in plane. Now, the DMI interaction in the transition region will promote specific orientations of this out of plane and in plane layer. Okay. So, we can use the DMI to effectively couple uh, regions of the same magnetic layer uh, that are out of plane and in plane. And this type of lateral coupling is. Uh, you know, quite unusual because it, we we know in general in spintronics we know many ways to couple magnetic layers that are stacked on top of each other. Right? You can do that by dipolar interaction, by uh, RKKY, and also using the DMI. But uh, to couple structures that are on the same plane, that is harder to achieve. You can do that using dipolar interactions, but then this uh, coupled elements need to be relatively thick because the dipolar interaction scales with the volume of the magnets in its known local. Whereas here we have a method to couple uh, structure on the same plane that is local and uh, is relatively strong. Okay. And so we proved this idea by patterning a, a single cobalt layer on platinum with regions of outer plane and in plane and isotropy, this can be done by selective oxidation of the uh, out of plane region. For example, you, you cap this system by a thin alumina layer, aluminum layer, you selectively oxidize the aluminum on top of this region here, and oxidation leads to perpendicular magnetic anisotropy here. And here you see the, the systems that were made by Saucho Lu and, and co workers. Uh, this is uh, in blue the region with in plane magnetization that is uh, capped by a, a, a mask that prevents, metal mask that prevents the oxidation of the aluminum uh, layer here. And this is the outer plane region. And by PIM, so photoemission electron microscopy, we verified that indeed the orientation of the outer plane and in plane regions are coupled in a chiral way as expected from the DMI in this system. Okay. And so you can uh, exploit this coupling mediated by an in plane spacer to realize uh, some, you know, a, a sort of a, a synthetic antiferromagnet in two dimensions where two out of plane regions of this island are coupled antiparallel by an intervening in plane spacer. And in fact, if you make the spacer sufficiently short, you can see that switching one of these two out of plane magnets induces the switching of the other one. So they're really coupled through the in plane. Right? And you can also measure the structures by measuring the anomalous hole resistance of the, uh, due to the out of plane magnetization of the right regions here. And you can see uh, uh, loops that are shifted with respect to each other, depending on the orientation of the in-plane layer. So it's a sort of a lateral exchange bias behavior. So using this, this chiral coupling and patterning of magnetic anisotropy, one can produce really a, a many interesting structures, uh, including this, this uh, synthetic antiferromagnets, but also artificial spin ices with either 
uh, non-frustrated or frustrated interactions. One can produce synthetic skirmions, which are not mobile. Of course, these are uh, you know, fixed at the position where the magnetic anisotropy has been patterned, but nonetheless are quite interesting objects. And we've also uh, seen that these uh, couple structures can be switched uh, by spin orbit torques without uh, in plane field, and they can be used to inject the main walls into race tracks. Now, why do I mention this? Because coupling spin orbit torques with these type of uh, structures where out of plane and in plane regions are coupled to each other by the uh, DMI is very interesting for manipulating the main walls. Now here we have a schematic, let's see if I still have time, yes. Um, we have a schematic of a, of a racetrack that is composed of platinum and cobalt, so cobalt is the, is the red and blue region. This cobalt uh, we have patterned the magnetic anisotropy such that it points out of plane in the red regions and in plane in the blue regions. And then uh, we send a, a domain wall into this racetrack. Okay, so we have an up down domain wall approaching the in plane region. Okay. This we send, so we, we can do this by uh, sending current pulses in this structure. And what we observed is that by sending a domain wall through this in-plane region, uh, something interesting happens. That is the domain wall on one side is annihilated, which induces also the switching of the in-plane region with respect to the previous alignment. And now the DMI uh, promotes the nucleation of a domain on the opposite side to satisfy the DMI coupling in this new configuration. And therefore, we have a domain wall that propagates now on the other side, but the polarity of this domain wall is now reversed with respect to the previous one. This is down up, and this was up now. So we have effectively a domain wall inverter, and we've proven that this uh, works in this kind of structures. And here you see uh, images uh, again measured by by a scanning tunneling X-ray microscope, where we see this approaching the main wall that approaches the in-plane region here. And when it emerges on the other side, this was black, white, and now it's white, black. So this uh, works, it actually works better if the in-plane region is shaped as a V here. And this can be used to realize, um, to invert uh, the information containing the main walls. As you see, for example, here we have a, uh, a train of the main walls or a train of domains, and uh, this is white, black, white. And when the when the domain wall emerge on the other side, these are black, white, black. And uh, these type of structures can also be cascaded, so we put more inverters one after the other, and these operations can be repeated. We can also uh, make the, the transmission of the main walls across this inverter asymmetric and therefore realize a, a, the analog of a diode, a domain wall diode that is operated electrically. Okay. We can see that uh, whereas a, a, domain, a symmetric domain wall inverter works for domain walls propagating in either direction, this asymmetric inverter only allows for transmitting the main walls for one current polarity, so along only one direction. Now, if you combine more racetracks and couple them by in-plane magnetized regions with this DMI coupling uh, that effectively uh, favors certain magnetic configurations uh, across the in-plane region here, then we can realize what is called a minority logic gate. So where the output of, so in terms of domain wall or domain magnetization that emerges from such a structure uh, depends on the um, uh, magnetizations in the 
input in a way that uh, you know the the uh, so here we, we have three inputs and uh, if the magnetization of input a is say up the magnetization well, let me show this this is going to be clear okay so we have three inputs one we call it a, a bias because it's it's kept fixed and uh, this in plane region that couples the uh, output uh, anti-parallel to to the inputs okay but now this coupling can be affected if for example we we reverse one of the inputs this is now uh, not favored by the dmi interaction and if we reverse the second input then the dmi interaction forces the output to switch okay so this uh, can be used to determine the orientation of the uh, domains in the output racetrack. This actually works, and we can, um, you know, determine um, the um, let's say the the uh, orientation of the domains uh, in the output racetrack by by propagating uh, domain walls that have been created at the input positions. In this, uh, depending on the geometry that we fabricate, can follow the, the truth table of an end gate, or an end or an OR gate, uh, as well as more complex gates like this, this you know, full header gate that works by cascading these different inputs. So this is all due to the combination of uh, spin orbit trucks driving domain walls through these structures, and jaruzinski moria interaction that couples uh, the um, input and outputs of the uh, racetracks at this uh, junctions regions. Okay. Now, in all these experiments, the propagation of the mains is performed by current, but the inputs have been um, set by an external field. So, of course, if you imagine this being used as a uh, all electrical logic devices, we would need to electrically determine the uh, domains in the input terminals and this can be done for example by stt or or stt plus sot um, uh, if we pattern tunnel junctions on top of the inputs which is not easy to do but is in principle possible another issue in making devices out of this um, uh, domain wall logic is scaling so our structures have racetracks of, uh, that are about a, a micron wide. If you uh, make them smaller, you gain in uh, absolute current that is needed to push the domain walls through the racetrack. But uh, there can be more pinning effects and more synchronization issues that, that become uh, a limiting factor in the end. And so this needs to be investigated. And uh, with respect to the, to the SOT switching, of uh, three terminal devices, we've seen that the combination of STT and SOT, as well as VCMA and heat is actually very beneficial for both speed and efficiency. But it would be nice to find materials that have intrinsically a large SOT efficiency. Okay. That's because the power required to switch a device scales as the current squares times the resistance or current density times the resistivity, and, uh, and therefore it's inversely proportional to the square of the spin orbit torque efficiency. Now, so if you combine this, uh, these two uh, parameters here, uh, as is done in this plot, we see that uh, you know, there are materials with uh, nominally uh, large spin orbit torque efficiency, but usually they also have a large resistance. So some of these uh, beneficial effects of increased SOT efficiency are then reduced by the large resistivity of these materials. So this is an area where, where it's very active uh, research, which includes not only spin holder effect systems, but also uh, rush by Edelstein effect systems with, uh, for example, oxide interfaces uh, that have demonstrated very large efficiency. One thing to pay attention when you compare results in the literature, 
a part that measuring spin orbital coefficients has some, um, you know, can, can have some, uh, um, let's say, subtleties in terms of uh, measuring methods and how results are compared. But certainly, when one measures the critical current required for switching, which are easy to measure, however, uh, one should take into account that this critical current depends strongly on the magnetic anisotropy of the system, as well as on the pulse duration of the, of the current. So it's not the same to compare switching at one nanosecond or in DC conditions. Uh, last, before I conclude, I would also like to mention that there are ferrimagnetic uh, systems that are being investigated because of uh, they have, on the one hand, a reduced saturation magnetization, which decreases the current required for switching, and also because uh, domain well propagation in the system has been shown to be very, very fast, um, uh, because they, they especially close to the compensation temperature where they approach the behavior of an antiferromagnet. And uh, we found a, a way to, to measure the uh, time result of this system, even without using tunnel junctions, uh, using a, a whole effect technique that is, um, I would say, uh, you know, not so complicated, but, but still new, that uh, works by uh, splitting a current pulse, uh, splitting a voltage pulse in two voltages uh, of opposite polarity applied to the opposite uh, sides of a whole bar. This creates a current propagating in, in a well-defined direction but a virtual ground at the position uh, of the whole cross. And that minimizes uh, the, um, you know, the effect of having a, a transient current in the whole arms that then uh, prevents time result measurements to be performed with, with enough accuracy. So using this method, we can time resolve the, the magnetization switching of of ferry magnets, this is gallium iron cobalt. And we also observed in this system that we have this um, incubation times. Okay. So this means that uh, the, although the domain wall propagation in ferry magnets is fast, very fast, in fact, like kilometer per second, uh, this is what we extract from this slope here. Uh, we do have also here this, this incubation delay issues that need to be taken into account. Okay, so with that, I conclude the talk. I hope that I've shown you that charge spin conversion due to spin orbit coupling is a very interesting phenomenon that allows to control the magnetization of many different materials, including uh, metallic heterostructures, magnetic insulators, 2D materials, and oxide systems as well as antiferromagnets, and it can be used for switching. It can be used to control and manipulate domain wall motion in racetrack systems. Uh, and what I've not shown, because this is not our, uh, exactly what we do, is it can be used to induce uh, gigahertz and terahertz oscillators, as well as uh, to perform uh, magnon, to induce and detect uh, magnons in a variety of systems. And uh, with that, I thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Petro, for this wonderful overview of your recent results. Really interesting lecture. Thank you so much. So, on behalf of everyone, I clap for you. It's wonderful. Uh, so, uh, there are a few questions. Um, I will uh, read it. So a question by a student, what is the importance of synthetic antiferromagnetic SOT switching of ferromagnetic layer? So the, the, the question is, what about switching of synthetic antiferromagnets? Yes. Yeah, so I, I think that's, that's a very interesting, um, uh, you know, topic because um, it's, it's, something that uh, you know can take advantage of some of the properties that are known for ferry magnets like reduced uh, ms and um, in some cases also faster dynamics um, it has also been shown that some of the systems have uh, a long 
spin diffusion length. And so one can uh, um, uh, work on, on relatively thick uh, synthetic antiferromagnets, which can have certain advantages, for example, to improve the stability of a free layer in, in a tunnel junction. So I think that's a very interesting uh, type of systems to, to investigate, but it remains to be seen um, you know, how effectively, for example, what is the, the, the actual speed of magnetization reversal in these systems, uh, and if the efficiency is really um, you know what is what is claimed in, in terms of uh, the currents that are needed to to switch fast, particularly because we we have to take into account also this uh, this uh, activation this incubation time is actually an activation time, and it is reduced by by going to strong currents or or voltages, right? But this, of course. Uh, then increases the energy consumption. So uh, I guess there is more work to be done, but it's potentially very interesting systems. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question by Pradeep Kumar Raut. Uh, he thanks you. Then in case of synthetic antiferromagnet in 2D, what is the interaction which couples the two magnetization antiferromagnetic? I understand DMI prefers perpendicular alignment. Okay. so. So the interaction, if you want to, okay. Consider this sketch of a, of a domain wall, right? Um, so what you see here, right, is that we have magnetization pointing down and up and in-plane magnetization. Now the, the direction of this in-plane magnet uh, is determined by the DMI at this, on this side and the DMI on this side. Okay. Now, the trick that we play here is that we artificially extend the in-plane region. So we make this, this in-plane region broader, but the DMI interaction at the boundary of this region, so here and there, remains exactly as it is in a domain wall. And so that couples this magnetization anti-parallel to this. Okay, so that is what is happening uh, here. Okay, it's like having half a domain wall here and half a domain wall there. Okay. Now this coupling um, is, so you, you can see this in different ways. Let me see if I can show this. I don't have all the, the slides here. I mean, I think maybe I can just add to the question like from your device, it seems they're like 500 nanometer roughly apart. So, what makes still them coupled at such a large uh, length scale? Yeah, so, so they're coupled until this in plane region is monodomain, essentially. Okay, so we found out uh, in experiments that this occurs uh, below, say, a length of the in-plane region of about 300 nanometers, and we achieve 100% coupling, which we measure by essentially by switching one part and observing if the other part also switches. So we achieve this this 100% uh, sort of uh, switching. Uh, probability um, for spacer, in-plane spacers that are shorter than 100 nanometers. So the arcade wire coupling is nothing. I mean, here, it's just the DMI. There's, there's, yeah, of course, then you, you can think of the DMI as being a special type of RKKY coupling. So that's uh, I think more of a theoretical argument, but it's mostly DMI. And in fact, you, you can also make the, this, in-plane region can be arbitrarily long. You can also make it, uh, you know, meandering. Um, 
and and the coupling at each interface is still there right it's only that if you want the the two out of plane regions to to respond to each other then this in plane region has to be single domain otherwise it doesn't work okay thank you uh, the next question by akash kumar yes what is the role of field like torque compared to the damping like torque in sot switching does vcma um, also tunes the field like torque of heavy metal ferromagnet oxide interface okay that's uh, also good question and uh, yeah i don't have the the slide here but um, so the effect of the of the field like torque um, it has essentially two effects for at least for a, for a system with perpendicular magnetization so one is that in general as as the field like torque corresponds to an in plane effective field it lowers the magnetic anisotropy barrier for switching. Okay. Uh, the other effect that it has is that um, it can either sum or subtract to the damping-like torque uh, in promoting the main, the main nucleation. So for example, the fact that we see here, uh, this is this, uh, red dot is the domain nucleation point uh, where where the reversal starts. Okay. Now, if you observe two situations in which the current flows in the same direction, so take for example this one and this one. Now, here uh, the damping light torque um, has the same orientation direction and also the field like torque has the same orientation direction okay uh, what matters is is here the direction of the in-plane field um, that is opposite in the two cases now um, the uh, without field like torque the uh, preferred nucleation point would be just at the at 90 degrees here just at the uh, center of this line here. Okay. The field like torque uh, makes it more um, favorable to nucleate in this position or in this position. So, rather, um, you know, shifting the nucleation point depending on the initial tilt of the magnetization on the edges, which is determined by the in plane field. So, yeah, to, to summarize, the field like torque reduces the barrier for the main nucleation and also determines the actual nucleation point in these structures. Okay, thank you. Uh, before we take the last question by a participant, I, I have one question, very simple question. So in the uh, SOT, the, the, uh, let's say if you take the uh, MTJ, so the uh, size of uh, the dimension of those uh, like a pillar laterally, how it is so significant? If it is well within the single domain limit, Still, you can vary the dimension, isn't it? The, the diameter, for instance. So, how is it so crucial? Yeah. So, um, unfortunately, we we never approach the single domain limit. So, uh, the smaller devices that we measured, um, made at IMEC, have a pillar with a diameter of forty nanometers, and that's still uh, what we observe is still describe at least we think because we, we cannot look inside the, the structures but uh, um, we think it's still the main nucleation and propagation so we don't achieve the, the, the single domain limit here uh, what we observe is that if we change the size of the pillar so the diameter of the pillar then the interplay of this different effects that um, that we have so so um, the SOT STT VCMA and heat changes uh, because uh, for example uh, the uh, the heat dissipation in a small device is more effective than in a large device and so heat plays a smaller role in the small devices. Uh, eventually, this can also be a problem because it, it means you need more current 
to, to switch small devices so that the, the scaling with the device size is not perfect. And these are, are things we would like to also to investigate in, in the future. Me, uh, just thanks uh, for this, uh, just for clarifying this. But I have just one more silly question, like how uh, the shape of the device is crucial. If you take, for instance, an, uh, like an ellipse, uh, elliptical shape, where the shape and isotropy will play a role and probably you can achieve the single domain state. Do you think that would be better? Uh, to, to be honest, I, I think that in terms of, of switching current, it will not be better. In terms of switching times, uh, I guess this has to be proven. Um, for example, if one can achieve some kind of precessional switching in these systems, this would be very interesting to study, but uh, we don't have a system where, where we observe single domain behavior. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, the uh, last but not least question by Sina. Spins that flow or reflection affects the magnetization dynamics in free layer while switching right. If that is the case, how field light torque governs the first magnetization in SOT induced switching? At what length scale field light torque is dominant over damping light torque? Well, um, so first of all, there, there is a, a you know the field like torque and damping like torque the their relative amplitude changes depending on the material system and so uh, there are systems that i mean the most of the heavy metal ferromagnet bilayers uh, in, in most of these systems the damping like torque is stronger than the field like torque and that is the main torque responsible for for switching that is also the case in our devices uh, in systems where, where it, it is the opposite, so the field light torque is stronger than the dampening light torque, of course, this is um, you know, different. Um, it also um, depends on the geometry of the, of the magnetization, right? Whether it is in plane um, or out of plane. So, um, at w whether this is a, a matter of length scale, this also depends whether the magnetization switches by, by domain propagation or by uh, macro spin uh, reversal, right? So, so the effect of the field light torque is different in the two cases. So I guess we, we cannot give it just a one answer uh, for that. But in, for macro spin, it can, you know, it's very easy to simulate this in, 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 in macro spin simulations. And, um, so far, micromagnetic simulations of the main wall motions show that for, for torques that are um, you know, smaller than the, than the damping, for field light torques smaller than the damping light torques, uh, most of the, the main wall propagation is determined by the damping light torque. We have some, uh, we, we made some simulations and also some measurements in, in this paper here. I think it's in the the supplementary information, we have measurements that address uh, specifically the influence of the field light torque on the domain wall propagation direction, which we made by tilting the, the in-plane field with respect to the current direction. So we see some effects there. All right, thank you. Uh, Petro, just last question uh, from one of my students, so I cannot avoid it, Isita Pandey. She's asking how switching power density depends on magnetic anisotropy. That, uh, I think I have a slide for that. Good. So um, these are macro spin models, okay? So uh, you have to take it just as a, a sort of a indication, okay? And, and they are uh, in, in this paper by Kim Jin Lin and, and co-workers. Okay? So this is the critical current for switching of a PMA layer by the damping light torque. And this is a, a typical macro spin behavior where magnetization starts from up. Then as the current is on, it aligns along the torque. That's the equilibrium direction uh, when the torque is on. And then it 
uh, spirals to the opposite direction. Okay. Now here, you see this is the, the effective anisotropy field. Okay, so it's the critical current is proportional to the effective anisotropy field minus the in-plane field that we need to determine the, the polarity of the switching. Okay, so in this simple model, it's roughly proportional to it. Okay. If you go to in-plane system, you still have a proportionality to magnetic anisotropy. Uh, now this is rescaled by the damping parameter alpha because the, um, the precession uh, actually assists the, the, the switching. And so in principle, for the same anisotropy field, you need a lower current to switch an in-plane layer. I hope that answers the, the question. This, this dependence on magnetic anisotropy is also observed in, in, is observed in most systems, even if the reversal occurs by domain wall propagation, because you have to nucleate the domain first. So there is some region in the magnet that has to switch uh, some uh, you know, nucleation volume that can be treated also within this, this approximation here. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so I think uh, we have discussed most of the questions. Uh, so again, on behalf of uh, my team, I'd like to thank you, Petro, and all the participants. Uh, uh, we are very happy to have you all with us. And I just like to announce that next two weeks, we'll have two, two talks. And next week, we'll have Dr. Uh, Professor Bibhas Rana from Pozman. And then uh, next week, Thursday, we'll have Professor Luis Fisho. Uh, the subsequent week, we will have uh, Professor Devangan Bhumi on isomorphic computing from IIT. And then Professor Albert, Albert Furt will celebrate one year successful completion of this uh, seminar series. Uh, so 50th talk on 3rd June. So uh, I wish you all good health, stay safe. And thank you so much, Petro. It was very